Welcome to Homemakers. 16th of June, summer's beginning. And in fact, we do have our first warm day. It's 27 degrees today, 80 Fahrenheit. For us, that's a bit of a heat wave. And we've generally had steady growth through the spring. We haven't had too many weather interruptions. We've had just enough rain. We're doing some watering. And it's my pleasure to show you around and, and how this all fits together. You're gonna to see a bit of almost everything in the garden. Uh, it will be quite a long video. There's a lot in here. You can use the timings in the description to find bits you might be particularly interested in. The background to it all is no dig. <laughs> so that means not disturbing the soil and feeding soil life on the surface with organic matter, which in our case is compost. And I use that because it doesn't give habitat to slugs. We're in a damp climate here, temperate oceanic. So slugs can be a problem. I know I mention them a lot, but I'm not worried about them because I've worked out how to deal with them. And you can follow my tips. And one thing, for example, is just the no dig itself means you allow beetles that eat slug eggs, toads, and not having wooden sides, that'll save you money as well. So you're reducing the habitat for slugs. And for example, if you look at these lettuce here, there's very little slug damage. Another tip is that we Keep the plants tidy, we remove any diseased or decaying leaves. That is food for slugs. And we're harvesting these regularly. So far for five weeks, tomorrow will be the sixth pick, the sixth week of picking. And these lettuce are growing in this space for the sixth year in a row. I'm trialing here no rotation, among other things. These potatoes behind me, that's the eighth year in a row of growing these potatoes in the same soil. This variety is Charlotte. It's a second early. These are from my home seed seed, in fact. And these will crop middle of July and we've got leek plants coming ready to pop in on the same day we harvest. So a lot of what's going on here is double cropping. For example, there's cabbage planted two mornings ago after removing the broad beans, which had just finished. And again, this is a no rotation. That's the eighth year in a row of cabbage after the eighth year in a row of broad beans. And you can see the pest protection. It's simple mesh to keep insects and pigeons, rabbits, if you had them. Very useful cover. It won't be on there for their whole life, but it's, particularly when plants are small, giving them some kind of protection really helps. And some kind of companionship. Like, look at these Brussels sprouts here. I find them amazing. Uh, how nicely it works. We're, we've been harvesting more and more carrots to make space for the new planting a week ago of Brussels sprouts there. And then we carry on harvesting the carrots. The mesh protects both of those vegetables. It's just a nice way you can overlap to fit more in because the season, the summer season is, is not that long. You know, we're 51 north here. And as a result, you know, it can be quite cold both early and late. I wanted to just show you the weeds. Where was I going to go? Is it down here? <laughs> you might notice I don't have many weeds, but I did find a few before the video just to show you what happens. Like that's a dandelion from a seed that's blown in. We've had a lot of dandelions and at that stage, they just flick out. And so often I'm doing this with my fingernails actually. That's why I've always got dirty fingernails and there's a bit of grass. If you remove weeds at this kind of stage, when they're really quite small, and in dry weather, you just leave them on top. It's very quick and job done. It's a lot quicker than if you let them get big and then have a, a big job in your hands. So that's one reason we've got very few weeds. The other one is because it's no dig. When you don't disturb the soil, there's less weed growth. So the main ones there are ones that are blown in, which is fair enough. Here I'm doing a little trial of comparing digging. <laughs> Same amount of compost, no dig with the compost on top. So the compost is dug in, compost on top. And one thing I want to show you here is that how we're maximizing the use of space. So this is lettuce and already the next sowing is between them. We're still picking the lettuce for another month. And actually I'm trialing parsnips there. So parsnips about a week ago. And then here were interplants of celery, interplants of multi-sown beetroot that went in just a week ago. Uh, here we had fennel between the French be uh, between sorry French beans between the fennel, and this is the last two fennel on each side. You see how well they've grown. They were sown mid-February. The onions were sown mid-February. The peas were sown mid-February in the greenhouse. We'll see that in a minute. The propagation. So 
we're maximizing the growing season by starting early and then also by overlapping because every time you put in an interplant that's already say three or four weeks old you're gaining three or four weeks of growing time because it's not in the soil it started off in here and when you overlap you're gaining even more and plants like it plants like being in proximity particularly when they're small so it's a brilliant way of propagating you see like there's 800 lettuce there for example this is my main cash crop i'm selling vegetables as well and this is the second planting of the year only because we're doing leaf picking we don't need to sow lettuce that often and they were pricked out uh, so we sowed them a seed tray pricked them out and this is a compost trial <laughs> there's a lot going on in here um, you can see also i'm not using huge space for propagation we're growing lovely uh, plantings as up there on the right there's even a watermelon uh, just that should work in this greenhouse it's a bit warmer than the polytunnel the tomatoes they're growing visibly at the moment and this melon actually is very interesting because we were watching it today and this time yesterday it was there so it's done all of that growing in one day that's one day of new growth plus of course all the other bits are growing at the same time so this time of year, plants are really piling it in. They need more water. We're watering it every second day, not every day. At the moment, only when it's hot. Sometimes less if it's not hot. And I'm not feeding. I don't give feed or fertilizer. It's one dressing of compost a year. That's the method for all of the plantings we do here. Uh, so the summer plantings, we're not putting on new compost. We're using the goodness that's already in the soil. It's kind of long-term fertility and all the soil life that's enabled by no dig that can find the nutrients which are already there. And even little extras like, I'm working out more and more saving my own seeds. So there's some onion and spinach and broad bean there. Among others, I'm doing quite a few bits of seed saving because when you can save your own seed, it's not always straightforward, but if you can, when you can, you get stronger growth. And another, enabler for getting all these plants growing is the hotbed so in in the greenhouse where we just were there's a space where we put in fresh manure in the middle of february from the local stables horse manure with straw and that makes it really hot and that's like a heat mat we put seedlings on top on a tray and this manure is now here so three months later it's been brought out here by adam with his trusty wheelbarrow and this has on top of the still fermenting horse manure six inches of 15 centimeter homemade compost but look at the temperature it's still pretty warm under there it's 45 degrees that's hotter than a hot bath and that's why this plant in the middle is not looking so brilliant that's a pepper plant hanging in there <laughs> whereas the plants all around the edge you can see they're looking reasonably healthy tomato melon aubergine uh, we'll see one to watch but it happens most year like this and Probably that pepper will be okay. It's going to cool down pretty soon. Well, in the polytunnel, the heat obviously all comes from the polythene, but not as much as in the greenhouse. And in fact, nights in here can be not much warmer than outside. It's the heat is really in the daytime. These cucumbers were sown only two months ago. Sown mid-April, transplanted mid-May. Now we're mid-June. And I'm just going to show you how I train them up. So the string is buried in the ground. You can see that in one of my shorts videos. We're putting out quite a few shorts now to give you tips on <laughs> uh, current things and like how to harvest, uh, or in this case, how to bury the string. And this one, I will do one more detail about this, but what I'm doing is there's the first cucumber down there. And that actually, if they stayed warm within about five days that could be a pretty full-size cucumber and then I'm leaving a gap I, I'm not asking the plant at this stage to grow a cucumber on every node then there's the second cucumber I'm leaving there then I've taken out that one there's the third one there and this is what I do I take out both the cucumber and the side shoot and that leaves the cordon stem it's called free and then I twist it around the string like this and it's a reasonably quick and simple way to grow your plants upwards and we're doing the same string method for tomatoes, for example. These are sun gold, for example, on this side. So they're, in our climate, they're brilliant because they grow nice and early and they also make incredibly long trusses like here. Well, I call it a long truss. 
And that's why I take off the bottom truss. I take off the end, because otherwise, by the time the weight of the fruit's pulling it down, they're, they're on the ground and then wood lice and ants and slugs eat them. So the, the second and third truss and so on, I leave alone. And I'm, again, I'm not feeding. I do give some seaweed. I feel that's worthwhile, sort of trace elements and general health and well-being. But I've got aphids. Uh, I'm just saying this to encourage you because I know that some of you have and people worry about them, fair enough. Um, generally, I don't worry too much. You can probably see them there, white fly and green fly, but not enough in my experience from what I've seen here to worry about. What we do is when watering, we'll spray them with water. That's a really good way to control aphids. Just knock them off. <laughs> uh, some of them will get back, but just keeps them in check and it won't be long before the other predators arrive like hoverflies, see? And it's still okay to water your tomato leaves because blight is not around yet, late blight. So until probably for another two weeks at least, we're safe from that and you can wet your tomato leaves. Likewise, the potatoes, they're not gonna suffer from blight. That's one reason I like second early potatoes. That's Charlotte again from Home Safe Seed. And here, these beautiful plants, I'm saving leek seed. And with leeks, you need more than one plant to get cross-pollination. And so you need a bit of space, obviously. Uh, just I left the nicest ones there to, to make seed, which won't happen until late August, September. We need some dry weather then for them to be good. Here is the herb garden, which we planted last year. And actually, we filmed about this time last year with Jacko McVicker, who supplied some of these plants. And that was in the previous video to this. We're just talking about our 40 years experience of growing organically and where we're at and how much we've regressed or not. And there's one or two beautiful plants I'll mention here like fennel and that's herb fennel. That's not the same as the bulb fennel, the Florence fennel we saw earlier. So this is perennial and I actually I value it mostly for the seeds. They're great in cooking. I have to catch them in September before they fall. And just in, close to the camera there is chives believe it or not and that Siberian chives which have quite a mild flavor and chunky nice in a lot of dishes well here is another of my favorites that's French tarragon <coughs> so <laughs> this is the I still call it the new area it's new as of last year so 15 months ago it was like what you see beyond grass and weeds and using no dig methods mulching on the surface. We've got mostly clean soil with one exception, which is bindweed. So there's still quite a bit of this pushing up from roots in the ground, but it's getting weaker. It's noticeably weaker than this time last year. So I'm encouraged. We're gonna keep at it. We are keeping at it. We put this on the compost heap too. It's fine to compost and it's diminishing in vigor. <laughs> These are beetroot from Home Safe Seeds, so that's pleasing me because that's, I hadn't done that before and they've been very vigorous and we've been cropping there for a month already from middle of May, which is really early. Um, multi sown onions, beetroot multi sown as well. Garlic with rust. This is one failure this year, not a total failure, but these are hard neck garlic and look at the size of the bulb. I mean, it's just tragic because the rust has taken away most of their green leaf before they've really had a chance to mature. The soft necks, we'll see at the end of the video, are actually quite a bit better than the hard necks. Here's a nice example of a plant going to seed. That is, the one with the purple flower there is one plant of frizzy endive. And you can see how it's spread out. I need to get in there and prune it actually because it's totally dominating the tomatoes on either side. But the idea is that will make endive seed. Uh, you only need one plant of those, thank goodness. <laughs> and that would make seed probably in August sometime, same as the lettuce behind. This is wild rocket, which I value for giving harvest when salad rocket is going to seed. So I don't sow salad rocket in the spring. Our spring and summer rocket harvest is from wild rocket and you can tell them apart by the flower color, yellow. If it was salad rocket, it would be white flower. Cabbage have been great and still are. We're going through picking selectively, the ones that come ready first. And I'm not needing a cover at the moment. We don't have too much pigeon. There's a bit of pigeon damage at the other end, but if you've got a lot of vegetables like this, it does make it easier. <laughs> the few pigeons there are, can't eat it all. 
and the butterflies won't be going for another couple of weeks yet so they're pretty clean this is second year asparagus this is what it looks like in its second spring i planted this just 60 months ago as crowns and overlap with broad beans for seed since this space is otherwise free and here we have the new planting of asparagus i might plant some beetroot along it actually uh, so these are crowns or even seed actually that have been in here just since this spring and now we have something fascinating something i'd not tried before and which is clearly not working <laughs> these potatoes i mean look at that it's it's a wood chip experiment so this last year in march uh, i got the chance to buy uh, at quite a small expense i bought three tons for 60 pounds of two-year-old wood chip so that sounded good to me and you can see how there's quite a bit of nice black stuff between the wood chip i'm only just down to soil level there though so there's a good seven centimeter close to three inches of wood chip on top and we put the potatoes in at soil level i thought there's the soil below nice homemaker soil i thought that would work uh, but it looks to me from the growth of these potatoes like the wood chip is taking the nitrogen basically that's what it does if you've got too much in or near the rooting zone we're putting it as a very thin layer on the pathways only not on the beds generally and up this end we put on less wood chip and mixed a bit of compost with it so you can see the difference in already the potatoes are better and over there as the camera swings around you can see the potatoes near the polytunnel that's the same seed potatoes put in at the same time and the difference there is that's just compost on the beds a bit of wood chip in the paths only so I kind of knew this already but it's fun, fascinating to see it in kind of real life and great for teaching too because you know I, I get it entirely there's a lot of confusion about wood chip partly because there's wood chip and there's wood chip and this is not a good wood chip I now realize it, it was hardwood, uh, well, poplar, and I think the guy chipped up logs. It wasn't like new growth green wood, which would be much better, wouldn't give that dramatic effect. So don't despair of wood chip altogether. I'm just showing you a worst case scenario. And if you do want to use wood chip, see if you can get hold of some towards the end of summer, early autumn, when you're more likely to get this year's prunings, for example. That's what I would call green wood. So <laughs> here we are making hay. Uh, had a couple of friends helping on Sunday, four days ago, and they cut the grass here. It's pretty much ready. It's hoping it won't rain this evening. I don't think it will. We're going to gather this up. Oh, yeah, that that aroma. There's nothing like it. Fresh hay that hasn't got wet. So we'll actually gather that up and put it in sacks. <laughs> this is my best way of storing it. And we use that in the compost loop uh, to soak up urine. So I know it seems a bit of a waste, but it ends up on the compost heap. I just cut a small section there, not the whole meadow. And there we have an example of two types of compost. I won't go into great detail, but it's just to give you an idea that what they look like. That's four tons of green waste compost is the black heap on the right and two cubic meters of mushroom compost on the left, which we've used a bit off already. But mostly my idea is to get them delivered before I need to use them, because when they're delivered, they're nearly always hot and steaming. And that's a sign that they're not ready to use. You'll get a similar effect but not as bad to the wood chip there. They're still taking nutrients to decompose, basically. Only for maybe about three months. So those of you I know, because I get a lot of questions about this, who've used compost that they think is ready. The, the seller says it's ready, but it's not. And that, if you've got problems, that's probably why. Hang in there. It'll get better in the later half of summer. Here we put on some nice ripe compost around seven centimetres, just under three inches, on top of grass and weeds in... February. So this is new, new no-dig ground. I did similar last year. You can see on the videos of the new area, we call it the new area playlist. It takes you right the way through from February to November last year, starting out and the, the end, which was the area to my left. This is this year's new area. And you can see what I'm doing is um, the black plastic helps to kill the bindweed above all. It reduces workload hugely. You know, this, for me, this is biggest virtue of no dig is time saving and allied to methods like this this plastic is a one-off i don't use it in subsequent years it's just where there's a strong pressure of bindweed in particular difficult weeds could be mares tail even 
and then the plants go in a hole. We pull the bindweed that might come through the hole. Squash are very suitable because they're wide spacing, sweet corn interplanted, potatoes as well. At harvest time, remove, take your harvest, remove the surface debris, roll up the plastic, job done. And then you could even make an autumn sowing of salad, say, if you want, whatever. This is my venture into cereal growing. It's rye, which, believe it or not, that's just a couple of seeds there growing all those stems. And I sowed those first of October last year, planted them late October. And what I'm planning, hoping to do is to get the harvest of grains by hand, not, not economically effective, but to, I've got a mill, make some bread. We'll see. <laughs> Yeah, and these are the potatoes. You can see how lovely they are growing through or with compost. This is bolotti beans growing up teepees. That works well to diff diffuse the wind rather than having a line. These are home save seed sown only six weeks ago. And here we can see slugs. And it's just to give you an idea, they're, they're not a serious problem here. They're mainly on the edge and that's the classic they're coming in from the, the long grass there probably, and even from this grass a bit, uh, it's, but it's not too serious. You know, the plants are still growing mostly, except when you plant very tender things or slugs susceptible, like these sunflower, look at that marigold. The slugs did a great job there. <laughs> and that's Aster actually. And so, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it just illustrates the point that edges are more difficult than middle. If in your plot layout you can minimise the edge by having more of a square or rectangle rather than a long strip, for example, that's a big help. This has been giving us a lot of pleasure and I hope you enjoy it. It's the, that's basically just grass and weeds flowering there. You see how the grass is even, they're really pretty. They've all got different shapes when they flower. There's a lot of pollen here now, clearly. A few butterflies, not as many insects as I expected, actually. And here we deliberately encouraged it by sowing more wildflowers. I bought a wildflower mix, a Somerset wild cornflower cereal. No, corn crops, <laughs> wildflower mix. So we got poppies and, and cornflowers and daisies and all sorts. It's quite a haven of peace and tranquility here. It's very different to the rest of the garden. Quite wild, as you can see. I really like this little garden, actually. This is just random. I love doing this, you know, just in, <laughs> for no particular reason. It just looks lovely. So we've got the poppies. This is Facelia, a really lovely mauve colour. There's a little foxglove, which Adam transplanted there. And then... Um, more to come, that's a forget-me-not actually, but here is these amazing wild alliums, honey garlic, I think it's called. And normally there's quite a few insects there. And a garden like this, I would weed. Like, I don't know how we missed this one. There's a sow thistle. You know, if you leave a weed like that to go to seed, which would be in about two weeks, little yellow flower and then thousand seeds, not good news. So. We'll be in here tomorrow probably <laughs> doing that. What I want to show you to finish is the compost making process, or one of them. We're doing quite a bit, like we've got three pallets over there to demonstrate doing it that way. Uh, I've got a little kind of Dalek bin there to illustrate doing it in a smaller scale. It's all feasible. You know, do whatever you can get hold of more materials than you've got in your garden to bulk up your compost making process, coffee grounds, whatever it might be. Um, paper, paper's really good to compost. And you know, this is the result. You, with no disturbance of soil, uh, we're putting on about three centimeters a year of mostly homemade compost and just planting into and through that. Plants are rooting into the soil mostly, which over the years is more and more enriched by the surface compost and you get strong growth and very few weeds. Here's an example of a heap which just finished. So we actually made it, I haven't filled in the dates, but we made it on the, between the 1st of April and the 16th of May. What I need to put in there is that we turned it last Saturday, 
which was the 11th of June. And I had a, a couple of friends again helping Ned and Francesco and they took an hour actually. They really got on with it and moved everything there, unscrewed the wood and then re-screwed it on again. And a little bit smelly in the middle. So we put a stake in the middle and I've just pulled it out. And so that's a kind of air hole in the middle to increase aeration a bit. But I favor solid sides. You might be noticing, um, it's, for me, it doesn't work. To, it doesn't mean that air flows in if you have slatted sides. So we l either line with cardboard or have solid sides. And look at the temperature again. So that, since turning, the temperature's gone up again. You can make lovely compost without heat. Heat is not a prerequisite for making compost, but if you do get heat, it'll just go more quickly. And this on average is eight weeks old. And you can see it's, it's already halfway to being compost. Still pretty warm though, so that's the clue that it's not ready. And I'm not sure what these white <laughs> growths are. But they look fun though. I'll get them identified soon. Uh, but this is a beautiful compost system. You know, you, you're working with wildlife, but just in a different way. Just to mention for these garlics, since we're passing, this is the, the soft neck from outside, grown outside, planted in October, looking okay. This, by comparison, is hard neck planted at the same time. <laughs> Not so good. We have cleaned these up since harvesting. But look at these. This is the same seed, same sowing date, grown in the polytunnel. Soft neck garlic and harvested just uh, three days ago. And we'll, we'll get these more dry out here. They're drying off already. And then plat or bunch them up and hang them inside the store. And uh, yeah, this is the current compost heat. So again, showing as hot as I want it, 70 degrees. And how do you keep the heat down? If you're putting a lot of green in, using material like this, so this is eight months old wood chip here, which I get delivered in say September. And it's much smaller pieces. It was, did have some green, it's got some conifer, that's fine. Uh, pH is not an issue. And then this is the result, that same wood chip after it's been through the mower. So there you can see the lawn mower chops it up into much smaller pieces. That means it'll compost more readily. And then we mix it with a little bit of soil, homemaker soil. And that's, if you like, my brown mix. So we're putting in quite a bit of that at the moment, partly because we're mowing a lot of grass. There's quite a bit of grass to mow here, which I value as an ingredient for compost making. It, it certainly gets it warm. And if I just lift this up, you'll see the steam rising there. And that means essentially it's going to compost pretty quickly. You can see we're adding bits of cardboard. I know not everybody's in favor of this. It's all just waste cardboard, paper, a lot of sticks in there, a lot of prunings, uh, woody material is great for holding air in the heat, all that material. You can get more updates on all of this that I've been talking about in the video through our weekly newsletter, which we charge five pound a month for. Do check that out on my website. And I hope that you'll <laughs> find it you can get results like this. This is a 10 year old garden, it's 10 years since I moved here. We'll be putting a video out on that uh, later in the summer or autumn um, to celebrate that. And I'll see you again in July. In fact, I'm giving a talk at Hampton Court RHS show in London on the 4th of July. And if you can't get there, I think that day is for RHS members only. We'll be putting a little video out from there uh, to show what it, what's happening at the show.